It was the plan that, if successful, would have changed the course of World War II. A simple plan. Kill Hitler. Many had already tried to kill Hitler, even before World War II had broken out. But though some of the plots had come very close to succeeding, Hitler seemed to have his own guardian devil and survived every one. All of the plots thus far against the Führer had originated either from lone nuts, ordinary people who one day had taken it upon themselves to assassinate him, or from a shadowy conspiracy of aristocratic army officers who feared that Hitler was going to lose the war and drag them and Germany down with him. Hitler seemed to sense these latent threats, and after 1941 he had started to withdraw more and more from public appearances. His personal security had become more robust and expanded, and the numbers and ranks of officers who had access to him had become narrower and narrower. This process had accelerated after the German defeat at Stalingrad in early 1943, and coupled with Hitler's deteriorating health and physical appearance, the Führer became an increasingly elusive figure, spending most of his time at his gloomy Eastern Front headquarters, the Wolf's Lair. The British, following on from the success of Operation Anthropoid, when British-trained Czechoslovak agents had successfully assassinated Reinhard Heydrich in Prague in 1942, started to think bigger. Why not simply knock off the German leader, cut the head off the German snake? But how to do it? How to get at Hitler and where? He was probably the most closely guarded world leader, and the British needed to discover a chink in his armour, a weak spot that they could exploit. Intensive study began of Hitler's movements, properties, and guard arrangements. Unlike the German officers' conspiracy against Hitler, the British had no inside access to the man. Special Operations Executive, SOE, in London, studied Hitler intensively, collating masses of information. After the D-Day landings in June 1944, several SS soldiers who had rotated back to frontline units from Hitler's personal staff were captured by the British. One, surnamed Dieser, was able to elaborate on both Hitler's routine at the Berghof, his private house on the Orbezalzberg near Berchtesgaden, and his guarding arrangements. But killing Hitler at his private home was to prove a very difficult event to plan for a Major H.B. Court, the SOE officer responsible for compiling a feasibility study, had his work cut out. The Obersalzberg complex, which was basically a private village containing not only Hitler's private home, but also a series of hotels and guest houses, and also the homes of other senior Nazi leaders, such as Hermann Göring, was carefully guarded by the SS. Martin Bormann, the Führer's secretary and head of the party chancellery, had been in charge of basically creating the Orbis Augsburg into a private Nazi village, and he created a special reserve that measured seven square kilometres. The entire area was wired off from the public with net mesh-type fences. The fences, which were not electrified, were studded with numerous wire mesh gates, many watched by armed sentries. Wack Company Obersalzberg was the name of an infantry battalion that was permanently stationed in the area. When Hitler was in residence, security was further augmented by the presence of the army's Führer Begleit Battalion, the Führer Escort Battalion, the FBB, as well as Hitler's 19 personal SS bodyguards from the Reich Sicherheitsdienst, the RSD. The Obersalzberg area was divided into three districts, or Berserker, Berserk 1 encompassed the area and buildings immediately adjacent to the Berghof. Berserk 2 was all territory including the Berghof, but excluding the Kelstein area, Kelstein Mountain housing the famous Eagle's Nest Tea House. RSD officers also manned the outer gates of the villages of Tengelbrunn, Klingeck and Au when Hitler was in residence. Berserk 3 covered the Kelstein area. Only supply, maintenance and guard shift traffic was seen within this outer zone. Different coloured passes were required to enter each berserk or security zone, and all cars would be stopped regardless of the rank or uniform of the passengers. However, there was one possible time that Hitler could be vulnerable to assassination when he was at the Orbe Salzburg, and that was during his afternoon constitutional, a walk he took every afternoon with a small collection of intimates to the Muslanakopf Tea House. 
The walk was less than a kilometre across the Obersalzberg Valley to the wooded Muslanerkopf Hill, where the circular tea house had been built in 1937 on Bormann's orders. The path was mostly wooded, and at one point passed a scenic overlook of the entire valley, enclosed by a wooden railing and with a bench where the Führer often sat and discussed matters of state with his intimates. Hitler often fell asleep at the Muslanerkopf and was always driven back to the Berghof while the rest of his intimates strolled back on foot in the late afternoon. And SOE's greatest ally in carrying out an operation to kill Hitler, the Orbe Salzburg, was Hitler himself, who seriously disliked being guarded. During his afternoon walk, SS guards were told to remain out of sight and well back from the Führer and his party. SS Private Dieser, who had worked as a guard at the Orbe Salzburg, along with another SS private called Obernig, also captured in Normandy by the British, said that during one point on Hitler's stroll, he passed close to a patch of woodland that placed him out of the line of sight of the static SS sentry posts around the Orbe Salzburg. This meant that there was a small window of opportunity to kill Hitler. The idea was so attractive that SOE considered extending the operation to kill Himmler, Göring, Goebbels and Bormann, and similarly detailed investigations into their movements, habits, routines and guarding arrangements were made. Working with the information on Hitler, Major Court and his colleagues in London began to work out how to assassinate Hitler at the Orbe Salzburg. It soon became clear that the most reliable method was a sniper attack when Hitler was walking along the path to the tea house and was very lightly guarded. The outline of the plan was for a German-speaking Pole and a British sniper to parachute into Austria. Dieser said that his uncle, Heidenthaler, who was strongly anti-Nazi, would hide the two assassins in his house in Salzburg, which is only 30 or so kilometers from the Ober Salzburg. From there, the two-man rifle team would infiltrate the Ober Salzburg dressed in German army mountain troop uniforms. There were mountain troops based quite close to the Ober Salzburg, and of course the uniforms were only designed to divert the attention of locals and patrolling guards. The men would not try to enter the Ober Salzburg security zone through any of the guarded gates, as they would not have the necessary documentation. Each man was also armed with a special silence Luger pistol for self-protection and infiltrating the Führer security zones. They would infiltrate through the fences, and once inside the enclosure, the sniper team would lie up in the woods close to the path that Hitler regularly walked. The pole would act as spotter, using powerful binoculars, while the sniper would be armed with a Mauser Carabiner 98K rifle fitted with a Zeiss Zilfier Times 4 telescopic sight. The rifle had an effective range of one kilometer, but the shot would be taken much closer at a range of around 300 meters. A British officer, Captain Edmund Bennett, was mooted for the role of sniper and may have begun training in England against moving targets. An alternative scenario was also thrashed out. To have a second assassin concealed along the road used by Hitler's car to bring him back to the Berghof from the Muslanerkopf tea house. This assassin would be armed with a Piet anti tank weapon to destroy the car should the rifleman have failed to get off a shot at Hitler when he was walking. In November 1944, Major Court presented his plan, now codenamed Operation Foxley, but it was turned down after some heated argument. At this stage of the war, many senior officers felt that Hitler alive was doing more damage to the German military than Hitler dead. There were also some reservations about making Hitler a martyr through assassinating him. Foxley was by this stage anyway a theoretical exercise because Hitler had left the Berghof for the last time on the 14th of July 1944. He would never return. However, Post-war analysis of the plan suggests that although German security forces would most probably have captured the two-man sniper team before they were able to get into position, if they had managed to conceal themselves along the path between the Berghof and the Muslanerkopf tea house, they could have killed Hitler with relative ease.
The main problem was that the plan came too late. SOE lacked intelligence about Hitler's routine until after D-Day, when they captured a few low-ranking former guards who had been returned to active service. By the time SOE had managed to thrash out an assassination plan, Hitler had managed to frustrate them by moving away from the target area. Whether SOE made the right call in 1944 in abandoning plans to kill Hitler, I'm sure will make for a lively discussion in the comments section. Thanks for watching, please subscribe and share, and also visit my YouTube channel War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon, details in the description box below.